Lee. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." Now all of this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall, shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and he took Mary as his wife but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. The uh, virgin birth of Christ, <clears throat> a miraculous birth. Some, some would call it a science-defying miracle, where a virgin is impregnated by God himself, and she gives birth to the Son of God. Supernatural, miraculous birth. No other way to describe it. And um, spoiler alert, if you come to service tomorrow, <laughs> 10.30 to 12, we're going to be doing a message. Not that whole hour and a half, by the way. But we will be doing a message on seven reasons for the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. If Jesus was not born of a virgin, then Christianity collapses like a house of cards. And so this miracle had to be this way. And what I'd like to communicate to you this evening is this is not the only supernatural birth that God is interested in. The book of Romans <clears throat> Chapter 8 and verse 29 says of Jesus, the Son of God, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. In other words, God's design is just as Jesus had a supernatural birth, a miraculous birth, those that are his children. In a similar way, not in an identical way, but in a similar way would be supernaturally born as well. Which raises the question, how is a person, how is a human being, how is a, a lost member of Adam's fallen race supernaturally born? And the answer to that is regeneration. The book of John chapter 1 and verses 12 and 13 puts it this way, but as many as received him to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but God. According to that verse there, the only person that's an actual child of God is a person that has also experienced a supernatural Miraculous birth, not identically, but analogous to how Jesus was born into our world. A person hears the gospel, they put their faith in Jesus for their salvation, for their eternity, for the safekeeping of their souls. And the moment that happens for a human being is the moment God does a miracle. It's, I believe, the greatest miracle that he's doing today. People sometimes complain, I wish God would do some miracles today. Are you kidding me? What God does is when a person places their faith in Christ, a miracle happens where they become alive spiritually. The Holy Spirit enters them and indwells them forever. They're regenerated and 
they're made to be like just how God intended people to be at the beginning. When Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, they were alive. They were alive at the soul level, they were alive at the bodily level, and they were also alive at the spiritual level. And God said, the day you eat from the tree of knowledge is the day you shall surely die. They didn't physically die that day when they rebelled against God in Eden, but the spiritual connection went out. And consequently, all of us are born into Adam's rebellious race, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, as spiritually dead. Uh, we might be alive physically, we might be alive at the soul level, but we have no connection to God. And consequently, in that state, what are we? We're, we're God's creation, but we're not his children. You don't become his child until you trust in the Savior who came into the world to undo what Adam did in Eden through rebellion. You trust in the Savior, regeneration or spiritual birth happens, and suddenly you're alive spiritually, and only such a person is a child of God. Before I was a Christian, I used to look at born-again Christians as just sort of a, a sect, if you will, within Christendom. Uh, I used to think, well, there's the Methodist Christians over there, and the Presbyterian Christians over there, and the Baptist Christians over there, and oh yeah, there's another group called the born-again Christians. Just kind of a denomination within Christianity. But according to the verse I just read, the only type of Christian that exists is the born-again Christian. If a person has not experienced the supernatural birth that I'm speaking of, they are God's creation, but they're not yet his child. This was the whole point of Jesus speaking to Nicodemus in John 3. This is the whole point. He did this at night. I call this the Nick at night conversation. And it says this in John chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must, notice that word, must, this is not optional in other words, you must be born again. Verse 6, he says, that which is born of flesh is flesh, but that which is born of spirit is spirit. Going all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, what you'll see is all of God's creation produces after its own kind. Animals beget animals. Human beings beget fellow human beings. And I believe Jesus is borrowing from that imagery to communicate to Nicodemus that the flesh cannot give you the life of the spirit. Because things produce after their own kind. You cannot become God's child by getting the flesh or our humanity to try harder. You become God's child because God does a supernatural work in your life. Which is just as real and it's just as miraculous and it's just as supernatural as the birth that we're celebrating here this evening. The birth of Jesus. And if that has not happened to a human being, then they are not God's child. If it has happened to a human being, then they are God's child. And this is a miracle that we call regeneration, the new birth. You know, in ministry, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Which raises an interesting question. What is the main thing? 
the main thing is that we are separated from God spiritually because of our condition in the first Adam, and God wants to do a supernatural work, a miraculous work, through the new birth. And if the church doesn't keep the focus on that, it drifts into all kinds of other subjects that are interesting, but they're not the main thing. What I'm talking about here is the main thing. Uh, a lot of people will go to sort of woke churches this weekend, and they'll talk about all kinds of subjects other than what we're dealing with here. And I notice that God has a sense of humor because he said this weekend you're not going to talk about global warming, that's for sure. <laughs> but it's easy to drift off onto any number of subjects other than this. This is the main thing. This is the miracle that has to happen in a human being. And this is what we call regeneration. One concluding verse, the book of Titus. Chapter 3 and verse 5, it says, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, to the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. The word regeneration is only used twice in the New Testament. It's used once of the coming millennial kingdom. Matthew chapter 19, verse 20, which will be a supernatural birth of a kingdom age one day on planet Earth. And the only other time that word is used in the whole New Testament, regeneration, is referring to the new birth that I'm speaking of here. The Greek word is Pauline Genesia. It's a compound word, <clears throat> meaning two words making up a single word. Pauline uh, is basically an adverb. It basically means again. And it's connected to the word genesia. And in that word genesia, you'll recognize the word genesis, right? The book of beginnings. Pauline genesia literally means beginning again. It's translated in English regeneration, but it's referring to beginning again. Why is it beginning again? Because a light comes on that didn't exist previously. And that light has been doused ever since Adam and Eve rebelled in Eden. And what God is all about is he wants to turn the light on. He wants supernatural births um, all over the world. Just as miraculous as was the birth of his son 2,000 years ago. And that's the main thing. And the only person that can give you this is God. A pastor can't give it to you. And a group of elders can't give it to you. A church can't give it to you. A denomination can't give it to you. You can't even give it to yourself by trying hard through ritual, it is something that only God provides via a miracle of regeneration because things produce after their own kind. And so this evening as we're celebrating the birth of Jesus into our world, we also want to give people the opportunity to experience the new birth themselves because we are convinced that there are many people listening to my voice maybe online, maybe in the building, that have never experienced this new birth. And the new birth is so easy to receive. In fact, it's so easy, people trip over the simplicity of it. It can't be that easy. And yet it is. How do you receive this new birth? The Spirit begins to persuade you of your need to receive this. And then you hear a proclamation of the gospel that Jesus paid the penalty for all of our sins, past, present, and future, 2,000 years ago through his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. And then you hear the message of the gospel, which Jesus says, it is finished. Jesus says, trust completely and totally in me 
for your salvation, for your eternity, for the safekeeping of your soul. And the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ alone, not, not yourself, not your good intentions, not your religious activity, but in Jesus alone, just like that, you're justified before God. And just like that, a, a spiritual spark happens in your life where you are born again and you can relate now to the things of the Spirit, which formerly you really couldn't understand because you didn't have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And so if you've never done that, we invite you to do it now. It's not a matter of joining a church, giving money, walking an aisle. It's not a matter of New Year's resolutions. It's not a matter of trying harder. It's a matter of trust, where you place your trust in Jesus, the light of the world. And this spiritual light comes on inside of you. If, if it's something that you're confused about or need more of an explanation on, I'm available to speak with um, after our service this evening. But it's the greatest miracle that God is doing today. There's nothing really on par with this. The virgin birth of Christ was awesome. But God is still in the birthing process. And we invite many, many people who hear this message to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ and have that spiritual light come on. So in a moment, Gabe is going to give some uh, parting instructions and this whole room is going to be filled with light and as this room is filled with light think about those two things a the light of Jesus through his miraculous birth and b the light that comes on in people when they trust in the provision of the savior let's pray father we're grateful for this evening grateful for the birth of your son Jesus Christ but also grateful for the miracle that you're, you're doing right now, where you're birthing spiritually people everywhere to be part of your church and your family and your body. It's a wonderful miracle. What a wonderful time to receive this beginning again at Christmas time as we look back and celebrate the birth of Jesus and look forward to the many births that you're going to do, even now as I am speaking. We'll be grateful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name, and God's people said. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. If I could get the signers up here. Some of the youth, led by Alyssa Wren here. Raise your hand, Alyssa. We'll be singing uh, Silent Night in a different language, in the language of sign, American Sign Language. But before we do that, uh, how we begin the lighting of the candles is that I will light the first candle. You will see some people with some lighters uh, posted uh, in, in the congregation. I will light mine, and I will share my light with another and they will share their light with another, so on and so forth. And so if, if we could dim the light, and then, Joy, if you could start.
Let's rise to our feet and sing Silent Night. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this time. And Lord, we give you all the praise and the glory because you are worthy. And so we just want to thank you for sending your son to this earth for us. And uh, we thank you for this church. We thank you for the word that's been declared. And we give all glory and praise to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And God's people said, amen. amen. Uh, you guys can blow out your candles. And once you're done with that, the, at, in the, the outside of the floor where you picked it up, you can drop off your candles. God bless you. You are dismissed. Have a very Merry Christmas.